This is the audio description for Indiana Disability Justice Task Force webinar number 11, The Spectrum of Prevention in Rape Crisis Centers, Risk Factors, and People with Disabilities, originally streamed March 26, 2020. I'm Barbara Faison, and I will be narrating any visuals or on-screen text that are not covered by the speaker. Links mentioned will be included in video notes. Good afternoon, or good morning, depending upon where in the United States or the world you are. You have made it to our webinar. Welcome. This is webinar number 11 if you can believe it already in our disability justice and sexual violence prevention series. The spectrum of prevention in rape crisis centers, risk factors, and people with disabilities. Haley Rigger, Rape Crisis Coordinator, ICESAHT. Sierra Olivia Thomas-Williams, ICADV Prevention Specialist. Sky Cantela, MESA Program Coordinator. Jennifer Malarsik, ICADV Disability Consultant. Stacked along the left side are small windows with video of the four speakers. They will be described when they speak. I am one of your hosts this morning, this afternoon, right now. Sierra is a fat, queer, cisgender, light-skinned Miwok woman with wavy brown hair pulled back in a ponytail. She wears a dark red pattern top, pale green cardigan, red lipstick, and red earbuds. I'm one of your hosts, <laughs> and I, um, we have a lot of ground to cover today. Our webinar is a collaboration between the Indiana Abuse Prevention Disability Task Force. Everybody that is on the webinar today, including the hosts, are members of the task force, and we've partnered with Indiana Coalition to End Sexual Assault and Human Trafficking, the State of Indiana Sexual Violence Coalition. And we are really excited to share our work with you here today. Um, this is a relatively large audience for us, which is really exciting. So we're just gonna jump right in. Today, we have 90 minutes together and I will come back to this agenda every so often so we can see where we are in the day. We're gonna take this day in sections. First, we're going to talk about housekeeping and accessibility, and then we're gonna get a little bit grounded in what we mean by sexual violence primary prevention and disability justice. And then we're going to talk about the work that the task force has been doing for several years and how does that apply to rape crisis centers and other um, kinds of businesses and, and nonprofits like that. And then we will uh, address your questions. So let's go ahead and get into the housekeeping and accessibility. Housekeeping, agenda, accessibility, biographies. Under the heading housekeeping and accessibility are icons of captions, speaker, PDF, webcam, and question mark. I just wanted to let you know that everybody that has joined us today has been muted automatically, and we are recording this. So you will get a copy of this video as soon as it is over and you can share that with other people. Um, one of the things that I want to draw your attention to is how we are increasing accessibility with this webinar. We have a CART, a CART provider. That's somebody who is doing live captioning for us right now, her name is Kathy, and I just wanna say thank you so much, Kathy, for helping us. Um, you are going to have to open a new URL, a, a new window, sorry, a new browser window to be able to see that captioning as it's happening. I have dropped the uh, URL in the chat box. Sky, would you mind uh, to drop that again in the chat box for folks? For access to the live streaming captions for this webinar, open a new browser window to the following URL. Narrator's note, the streamtext.net URL was only available during the live stream, but captions will be added to the archived webinars. I'm gonna go back one slide so that if you are interested in seeing the live transcript, you can just open another browser and take a look at it. 
One of the issues that people often have with webinars is with being able to hear. And so I want to draw your attention really quickly to the dashboard for your webinar. Inside that dashboard, there's a little section called audio. And if you play around with that, you can probably hear better if for some reason you're not hearing right now. If you are experiencing technical technical difficulties or you do want to talk to us, go ahead and pop a question in the question box or a chat in the chat box. I do want to let you know that one of the limitations for GoToWebinar is that the audience can't see your questions and they can't see your chat. So it only comes to us staff members. And so we will um, we'll be able to see your concerns and address them. And um, trying to think oh I want to draw your attention to the handouts section of your dashboard there are five handouts in there for you if you are interested in getting a copy of the slides that we are going to be talking about today it is there in the handouts um, area there's also an FAQ in the handouts area for you should you come up on uh, any issues um, during the presentation today. And this is me. Um, we're going to go ahead and get into biographies. On the right is a smiling car selfie of Sierra with her wavy brown hair down to her shoulders, almond-shaped glasses, and a simple metal labre piercing below her bottom lip. I don't need to spend a ton of time here. I've been working with the Rape Prevention and Education Grant since 2005. I've had the opportunity to work as a prevention specialist at Indiana Coalition Against Domestic Violence for five years now, a little more than five years, really exciting. And I am the co-founder and co-facilitator with my um, project partner, Sky Cantola, from Multicultural Efforts to End Sexual Assault. And I am a person with multiple disabilities that tend to be invisible. And I'm going to go ahead and mute myself. Jen, would you mind? Jen is a white woman with wavy light brown hair to her neck. She wears a pink hoodie and a black headrest is visible behind her. Jennifer Malarsic, she, her. On the left is a close-up photo of Jen. Yes, I sky with you and great. Yes, uh, Jen said, Sky, will you please interpret? And I said yes. Sky is a fat, white, trans person with short, cropped brown hair and wire rimmed glasses. They wear a gray striped shirt. Um, I am Jennifer Mihalik. I have um, physical and mental health disabilities. I love to work and Volunteer helping wherever possible. I love to work and volunteer helping others whenever possible. Um, I believe in promoting equality and justice among marginalized people. I believe in promoting equality and justice among marginalized people. And I depend on my strong faith to guide me through and enjoy life. And I depend on my strong faith to guide me through life. And I can start with the in the American American Domestic Violence. And I consult with the Indiana Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And I'm a task force member. And I'm a task force member. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Haley Rigger. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Rape Crisis Center Coordinator at the Indiana Coalition to End Sexual Assault and Human Trafficking. Haley is a white woman with long, light brown hair and dark, thick-rimmed glasses. 
she wears a dark blouse with rose print. I'm also a task force member, as Sierra mentioned earlier, and I also serve on the Indiana Protection for Abused and Trafficked Humans Task Force, that's the IPATH Task Force, uh, where I sit on the Adult Victim Services Committee. I'm a former crisis intervention care coordinator at a community mental health center, and I also previously worked as a direct support professional about uh, a decade ago now. Um, so those two things kind of grounded me and centered me in disability justice and kind of opened my eyes a little bit. To the right of her bio is a portrait of her smiling in a burgundy button-up shirt with white and green print. Um, what's not listed on the screen that's maybe a little bit more important is that I am an aspiring ally in the disability justice movement. And um, because of the task force, I am constantly learning and growing alongside all of these amazing people. Hello, my name is Sky Gundula. I use she and they pronouns. I'm the program coordinator at the Multicultural Efforts to End Sexual Assault since 2013. I have created a really cool art adventure called Fairy Bear Art, where I explore the connections between creativity and trauma healing. I am also a board member of Pedagogy and Theater Via Pressed since 2015. It's an incredible organization that looks at anti-oppression in education and embodied practice. Um, I'm also a queer, trans, and intersex survivor with disabilities. I'm proudly autistic, um, and I love doing prevention, and trauma healing, positive dog training, caring for the earth, and obviously memes. Um, there's a photo of me uh, that has been memed. It says, so morning, much new mode, and it is one of my favorite mustache mugs, and I have also decorated my face with a purple pen mustache. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sky, for uh, doing a little bit on the fly accessibility by letting us know what that picture looks like. I appreciate that so much. Before we get into the main crux of our um, presentation today, I just want to let everybody know that we are funded through Indiana State Department of Health and through the Centers for Disease Control, and they may not 100% agree with what we have to say here today. Funding for this webinar was made possible in part by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Indiana State Department of Health. The views expressed in written materials or publications do not necessarily reflect the official policies of the Department of Health and Human Services nor does the mention of trade names, commercial practices, or organizations imply endorsement by the U.S. government. All right, we're gonna get into our grounding now. Finding Common Ground, SVPP and Disability Justice. How do these concepts come together? On the right is a photo of two large trees in a hillside with dense interwoven roots with brown leaves spread throughout. And what I want to do is pull together two separate approaches or two frameworks and show how they feed each other and, and make each other better, I really think. So our work really allows us to draw on the framework of the public health approach um, and disability justice allows us to get at some of the things that the public health approach um, don't include as an imperative. And before I do that, though, um, we want to talk about the spectrum of prevention services. So I'm going to turn it over to Haley to address that. All right. Thanks, Sierra. Uh, so when we talk about the spectrum of prevention services, um, we're using a public health framework to talk about this. So there are kind of three um, main areas that we're going to talk about today. So there's primary prevention, there's secondary prevention, and then we have tertiary prevention. So uh, these cute little graphics that Sierra added for us um, are really going to help us understand what we're talking about. Primary prevention um, is that that's the stuff that we're doing before the problem exists. So we want to prevent the problem from ever occurring in the first place. Under primary prevention is an illustration of a four-way stop at a park with several people both on and off the path. There are concentric circles around a statue at the center of the crossroads and lots of writing, but it is all too small to make out. 
So these are initiatives that promote social inclusion. Um, they create safe, stable, nurturing environments for everyone uh, where violence not only isn't tolerated, but it's just not happening. Um, so this is stuff like active social inclusion, education about sexual wellness and bodily autonomy, um, and things like that. Secondary prevention uh, is stuff that we're kind of dealing with the problem after it's happened. So this is the crisis intervention stuff. Um, where this, these initiatives are designed to intervene after the violence has occurred. Um, and we're going to see a lot of interaction here with like emergency shelter, maybe for somebody that needs that after victimization, um, maybe medical care. So they're seeking services, maybe with a sexual assault nurse examiner. Um, we might also see interaction with law enforcement or prosecutors, um, legal advocacy, that sort of thing. And then the third prevention uh, initiative that we're talking about here is that tertiary component. So tertiary is the aftermath. Um, we're past, the problem's already occurred, we've gotten through that crisis intervention piece, um, and now we're talking about long-term stuff. So this is long-term counseling, um, maybe crisis lines and supportive services that are available throughout the lifetime of, this, of a survivor, um, ongoing support groups, um, and social connection, that sort of thing. Under the word counseling, there is an illustration in pastel colors of six people sitting around and talking surrounded by a rainbow aura. All right, back to you, Sierra. Thanks, Haley. Appreciate that. Pardon me while I advance the slide. <laughs> so sexual violence primary prevention and, excuse me, sexual violence perpetration and victimization always happen within a context of a relationship or where we work, live, and play. And so this is another tool that comes from the public health framework. It's called the social ecological model. Primary prevention is a health promotive practice that enables or creates social conditions that are safe, stable, and nurturing for all people. And what it allows us to do is break down sexual violence primary prevention into smaller pieces because primary prevention concerns itself with the health of the population. And so we are talking about all the people here when we are thinking about sexual violence primary prevention. And so these nested circles really demonstrate to us that people's individual thoughts, feelings, behaviors, even their epigenetics are contextualized by something bigger, by something that is in the environment. And so this, the individuals are impacted by the quality of these other forms of um, interaction in their lives, like interpersonal relationships or the kinds of services that organizations might provide in a neighborhood or uh, you know, alternatively, what kind of organizational practices are there? The diagram of nested circle starts at the bottom with an orange circle, individual, surrounded by blue, interpersonal, green, organizational, yellow, community, and the outermost circle is red, societal. For example, does your organization have FMLA? to protect you right now, because a lot of us are expected to be at home and be working from home. And what is the context of your community and the society? So we are really thinking about high impact initiatives, things that change the context to be more safe, stable, and nurturing for everybody. And so how do we create those conditions that allow for the safety and stability of everybody. This diagram allows us to break down this giant puzzle into smaller pieces that we can then focus on. And the, one of the things that this framework does not require is for us to look at the imperative of, of equity, of, of the differential access to systems and resources and opportunities that many people experience over their lifetimes. And this is what disability justice frameworks can uh, provide to the public health approach that it doesn't currently require. And so while we are, this slide is really simplified. I'll just, I'll go ahead and say that. The slide is simplified and, um, 
it what I've done is I've taken some of the features that I have understood to be the public health approach and some of the features that I have understood to be disability justice and kind of tried to compare them. It's an imperfect comparison, but um, so the public health approach did emerge out of the medical and scientific field and legal field, and yet it claims to be apolitical and because of the differential application of working on the social determinants of health, so these things that we need like transportation, education, healthcare, um, those things are not distributed equally. So this, the public health approach really does assume that there is a level playing field. And what disability justice does is it says that it, like all bodies are politicized and all of us have more than one identity. So I am indigenous and I am also queer, but I'm also cisgender. And disability justice allows me to keep all of those, um, plus more like the fact that I'm fat, all of those at the forefront of my thinking and my politic. And so what's great about uh, disability justice is that it does allow us to understand and see that um, that things are more things are not uh a historical i think is what i want to say so primary prevention with the public health approach it, it starts when somebody is born and ends when that person dies but disability justice allows us to understand that when a, a person is born into a historical context that will shape their experience and their access to resources and opportunity. And um, that we think that's very important. Public health is often by people with degrees and power, and there's nothing wrong with that. It just is also pretty exclusive. I will go ahead and say that I am one of those people with degrees and I have this position. Um, that's, I feel like that's significant amount of power. The fact that I get to talk to 284 people right now is amazing. Um, disability justice, though, is led by the actual people in the movement. Um, I know we could probably say that about public health also, but disability justice allows people to be as they are. You don't have to have a degree to be considered to have expertise in something. SVPP, Public Health Approach versus Disability Justice. Public health is apolitical, legal, medical. Disability justice is political and intersectional. Public health is population level, lifespan. Disability justice is all bodies, whole body, whole life. Public health is health promotive, social conditions before the violence. Disability justice is multi-issue politic across the spectrum of prevention services. Public health is often led by people with degrees and power. Disability justice is led by the people of the movement who sometimes have degrees and power. Public health is solution-focused. Disability justice is interdependence, collective access, and collective liberation. The process is an outcome. And I actually um, want to stop here and have Sky talk about that last final um, idea of disability justice, so I'm going to mute myself. Thanks, Sierra. Um, so one aspect of disability justice we were talking about as we were preparing this is that typically justice movements have an understanding that our process is our outcome is our process. Um, sorry, I'm going to say that again because a car just drove by and I'm working out of my house and I live at a loud intersection. Uh, what I said was the process is also the outcome and that is also the process. So what I mean by that in terms of violence prevention efforts and disability justice is, for example, our task force, um, we are constantly thinking about how can we run a task force in collaboration with all of the people there in a way that does not recreate um, despairing uh, power dynamics. So, for example, we have a set of communication guidelines that we implement every time we meet to make sure that we're all on the same page about how we want to work together and how we want to address power dynamics in our group. 
Um, we also implement, for example, something called mutual aid networking, which is a really cool thing developed by disability advocates um, to try to figure out how can we support each other, not just as professionals, but as people and as colleagues and friends. Um, and very often, I think, in fields that are professionalized, like public health, it can be really easy to fall into a practice where we're not necessarily taking care of each other just as people. Um, so that's what I mean, for example, by our process is also hopefully our outcome, which our desired outcome, of course, is less violence, greater humanization, um, and anti-oppression. But uh, for us, I think it's really important that we are creating a process by which we achieve those outcomes. Um, another really famous person who has taught about this, um, I believe, is Audre Lorde, where she said the master's tools cannot um, take apart the master's house, which, I'm sorry, I'm probably not directly quoting, I'm paraphrasing, I should say that, but uh, the idea is that if we use violence to try to create anti-violent outcomes, that will not happen. We have to use anti-violence in our practice to create anti-violence as well. Um, I'm gonna stop, I hope that's clear. If something is not clear, please feel free to send us questions and we will try to answer the best that we can. Thank you, Sky. Ultimately, what we want to do is impact the most people. And so one of the ways that we can increase our impact is if we choose sexual violence primary prevention strategies that are implemented within organizations, community, and society that impact the organizational level, the community level, or societal level. And we are going to get into what that looks like, uh, like right after this. But one of the things that I wanted to share with you is how ICADV makes the decision about sexual violence primary prevention strategies when we know that the public health framework alone does not require us to address equity. We have a strategy selection framework that we use called E4. And every primary prevention effort, every decision actually in, in the entire coalition about everything, we run it through E4. And if it does not pass E4, then we don't do it. So what is E4? We want to know if our efforts are efficient. That's important to us. And so when we're thinking about efficiency, we're thinking about shared risk and protective factors. So what I mean by that is social isolation is one of the biggest risk factors for sexual violence perpetration. And so, um, working on risk factors to reduce social isolation will also decrease intimate partner violence and child maltreatment, suicide, youth violence, and I feel like there's one that I, I left out. So efficiency is not about, it, it is about doing more for less, but the more is the risk and protective factors. Doing more with less, I feel like is kind of typically how we think about efficiency. Like we have less and less funding to do these grand strategies that we need to do. We ask ourselves too, not only about efficiency, but is it equitable? Are we asking the people with the power to make changes to make those changes? Or are we asking people who are disempowered to change their behavior as a means to change culture? It, it, it won't work if we, if we do that. So is, is our, um, I'm sorry, equitable, equitability is also about focusing on populations that have been left behind or marginalized by the movement to end violence. Not everybody has been included in these efforts. And so um, that also ties in with the ethical part. Who, whose burden is it to change? And at, at ICADV, we think it is important to make sure that it is on those with the power to make the change. And finally, is it effective? What kind of evidence are we using is important. 
science-based evidence is great, but so is practice-based evidence and practice wisdom. And so if I, th I think if we use those that tool to select our strategies, we are far less likely to increase or uh, yeah increase inequity. Whoops. Okay. We are transitioning into Haley and Jennifer, and I think before we do that, we're going to go ahead and run our first poll. A picture of a worn black sign that says polling station. And so this is an opportunity for everybody who is participating to go ahead and take a look at that poll. Haley, do you wanna read that and talk about it? And I'll just go ahead and throw up the responses um, and, and whatnot. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, so when we started developing this webinar, we were um, mostly thinking of sexual assault programs or rape crisis centers. Um, but there are a lot of you that registered for today, and so uh, we realize that there are all kinds of people here today, but you may not necessarily be a rape crisis center, but you could still maybe be doing some of this um, primary prevention work. So we're just curious, um, what types of sexual violence prevention does your agency already engage in? Um, I, so I know a lot of our programs do um, work in schools around healthy relationships or bodily autonomy. Um, there are also a lot of engaging men programs, bystander intervention, um, and there may be other things that we're not thinking about. So if it's other, please um, just type in the question box uh, and Sierra will read that out yeah. for us. And I'm just going to go ahead and um, say yoo-hoo to the people <laughs> who are um, multitasking. We need you. Um, we are nearly 50% participation, so I think I'm going to go ahead and cut us off. Okay, we've hit 50%, so I'm gonna close the poll and I'm gonna share the, the results. And I will go ahead and leave that up to you, Haley, if that's okay to explain. So unfortunately, I can't see any of the question box responses that we received. Oh. Just a heads up, Sierra. Okay, shoot. Okay, so I, can see I the will. If you would like. Oh yeah. Um, okay, so uh, there's one person who said many programs do more than more than one of these, but we can only pick one. Uh, yes, that is true. It's just a um, it's just a quick internal webinar poll. We're not going to use this data that y'all are giving us for anything else. Um, so maybe just pick the one that you feel is most robust or rigorous. Um, another person said, I am a case manager for people with disabilities who work with many of my clients and their families on the possibility of exploitation physically, sexually, or financially. Um, another respondent said, we do education with youth, community mobilization with youth, implementing primary prevention programs with high school athletes, and policy work, et cetera. Um, another person said they do healthy and safe relationships for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, another person said we do K through 12 relationship, body autonomy, but also tech safety, trafficking, bystander intervention, et cetera. Um, there's actually quite a lot of responses, so I don't think I should read all of them, but yeah, there's a lot of really awesome responses. Um, we, just to read the poll, 46% of respondents are doing K through 12 relationship or bodily autonomy curricula. 12% are doing engaging men programming and 24% are doing bystander intervention. And then that um, the last 18% of the folks who voted, Sky was reading aloud what they're doing. So it sounds like we have uh, a wide variety of things. I'm going to take a look to see if anybody is doing any of those upper levels of the social ecological model work and if you are and you want to brag about it you can go ahead and drop it in the chat and we'll mention that i'll move on from the slide now so we can um, go on with our discussion i'm on my computer to do something here we go okay so now we are now we get to talk about 
what we did. And I, before I pass the mic, I just, um, I'm going to talk about the literature review that we got to do. A picture of a magnifying glass sitting on a notebook open to a blank page. So in 2017, um, we interviewed a bunch of people just to find out if we wanted to work on this problem. The problem, the fact that there is absolutely no sexual violence data regarding people with intellectual developmental disabilities. The answer resoundingly was yes, let's figure this out as a state. So we created a, the Abuse Prevention Disability Task Force in 2018 and we came up with, we spent a lot of time visioning together and trying to figure out our goals. Once we did that, we applied for rape prevention and education funding and we were awarded. And so part of the work that we did to um, try to figure out how, what kind of strategies, sexual violence primary prevention strategies we need for people with disabilities in Indiana, we needed to find out what risk factors or protective factors there possibly were that the C Centers for Disease Control or any of our other data collectors haven't um, maybe captured yet. So um, what we ended up doing is, like I said, we did a literature review. So the search terms were um, sexual violence, rape, um, sexual assault, and risk factor search phrase, protective factor, search phrase, and the work that I did, I used those correlated with intellectual and developmental disability. And so the way that um, you have to limit your, your research somehow. So because most of the training and technical assistance I do that we do is with people in Indiana or people in the United States. We focused only, we tried really hard to focus only on things that were going on and research that was happening in the United States. And we drew the line at the year 2000. So um, what, what kinds of things were we looking for? Of course, we were looking at academic articles and science-based evidence, but we also, we're looking at toolkits and websites. Those things are practice-based evidence, those things that are created directly from the movement and shared widely for everybody. And also community rate resources and practice wisdom. So this included things like the National ARC website or uh, the toolkit that Kelsey Cowley, a task force consultant from last year, produce as a um, out of her fellowship with SARTAC. So we did not just include scholarly evidence in this. And I am going to pass the mic now. Hi, Sky, are you ready? Yes, um, I just want to say somebody has said they are having difficulty hearing, so I'm going to stop answering questions and ask Sierra to answer questions. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, Got it. Are we ready? Yes, um, I'm ready. Many, they have many with that do for people with disabilities. There are many risk factors for people with disabilities. Um, they may be specific to Iberian or universal. There are many risk factors for people with disabilities in specific to certain life areas and universal. Um, but all of these are related to society as it used people with disabilities. But all of these are related to the societal at society's attitude towards people with disabilities. One with factor is lack of education. One risk factor is lack of education. Uh, a 
Many people with disabilities may be left out of education. education. Sorry, can you say that again? Education. Oh, yes, many people with disabilities may be left out of sexual education. They might not know how their body works or what is private versus public behavior. They may not know how their body works or what is private versus public behavior. Um, the next that is a negative attitude. Another risk factor is negative attitudes. Read attitudes. Read those with disability vulnerable. Many societal attitudes leaves those with disabilities vulnerable. Um, the fifth degree is they have multiple marginalized groups like having a disability and associating with the LGBTQ community. Especially for people who are coming from multiply marginalized groups, such as people with disabilities and LGBTQ communities. Um, this belief is another risk factor. This belief is another risk factor. And this just means that people seem less credible. People with disabilities are may seem less credible. And this just isn't. Right. You say, or as if they're lying? No. And this is not right. And, and this is not right. Um, another factor is hang up or Broad ideas about sexuality. Another risk factor is hangups or false ideas on sexuality. Um, a lot of people think people with disabilities are asexual or non sexual. Many people believe that people with disabilities are asexual or non-sexual. And this is not true and it is proven that they go through the same stages and feelings at the same age as their and this, it's not true that people with disabilities are inherently asexual or non-sexual, and people with disabilities often go through the same stages and feelings at the same age. Um, so, so I question which is another risk factor. 
Social isolation is another risk factor. This can be an over-controlled environment. This and it can also look like lack of transportation or internet or lack of staff. And the caregiver might not be comfortable addressing these issues. The caregiver may not be comfortable what? Addressing these issues. The caregiver may not be comfortable addressing these issues. Uh, another factor is offender accountability. Another risk factor is offender accountability. And basically, the offenders don't get caught or they don't get charged with the offense. Uh, they, uh, the offender may not get caught or held accountable. Yeah. Um, this is a preventive issue and, uh, and has a large impact on people with disabilities. This is a pervasive issue and has a large impact on people with disabilities. The lab with that that we identified. The last is, risk factor, sorry, the last risk factor that we identified is social barriers. Service barriers. Um, there may be cultural and societal barriers accessing help. There are cultural and societal barriers to find and access help. Like the fact that somebody who is deaf might need somebody the fact that somebody who is deaf may need somebody to interpret using sign language. Uh, um, and there is a lack of caregiver and staff support. Yeah, I said help. And there is a lack of caregiver and staff support to access help. And the agency and the organization just may not be equipped to assist people with disabilities. And agencies or organizations may not be equipped to assist people with disabilities. And now we can go to Haley. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I just want to bring your attention to the chat box as well. Sierra reminded us that um, in your handout section, you can access the booklet that has the graphics of the risk factors that we're talking about. 
All right, so Jennifer just covered the societal risk factors. Um, so I'm gonna talk about community risk factors. And I kind of think of these as the systemic things that trickle down from the societal like undercurrents uh, that Jennifer was just sharing with us. Uh, so poverty is a huge risk factor for folks with disabilities. Many people with disabilities earn less than $15,000 annually. Um, add in healthcare costs and the costs of living with disabilities, such as paying more for accessibility, uh, which we'll talk about later, um, can further limit spending power for folks who are already on a fixed income. We also see a lack of internet access, which could be due to a lack of providers, such as in rural communities, um, or just having limited support in accessing the internet, which um, Jennifer kind of shared earlier. Um, this can lead to limited access to community, further social, social isolation, um, limited opportunities, and lack of access to information. Uh, folks with disabilities also experience pretty severe underemployment. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the rate of employment for people with disabilities is only around 19% compared to nearly 66% for people with disabilities. Um, a lot of folks also don't have access to public transit. That could either be because they live in a place with limited um, or no public transit available, or because the transit that is available isn't accessible. Um, so thinking like, broken wheelchair lifts on buses, broken elevators and subway stations, or information at transit hubs is only given through audio, um, through a speaker system rather than maybe printed or available in braille. Uh, we also see limited or no accessible transportation for folks with disabilities. So in places where there isn't public transit, um, folks might try to use a ride sharing service, which is generally pretty inaccessible to riders who use mobility devices or service dogs. Um, and these riders report hostility from drivers or just having their ride canceled uh, when the driver realizes that there's a mobility, mob mobility device or a service dog. Um, and then also, of course, accessible personal vehicles are often prohibitively expensive for folks with disabilities. So you can see how all of these risk factors kind of compound upon each other. Um, and kind of create this awful cycle that's hard to break out of. Um, so an individual is already experiencing poverty, um, so they may not have the funds to get internet access. Um, so then they can't really apply for a job. Even if they do have a job, maybe they don't have transportation to get to that job, which furthers uh, that cycle of poverty. All right, so we'll go on to the next slide and look at organizational risk factors. Um, so these organizational risk factors, um, these are pretty specific to disability serving agencies, but we can kind of see this in a lot of other industries as well. Um, so we see a lack of resources for organizations that serve people with disabilities, both due to funding, but also due to a lack of data, like Sierra was talking about earlier. We had to, to really do a deep dive into um, a literature review to get the information that we needed. Um, staff turnover is also a huge issue right now in the disability community. There's a huge staffing crisis in disability service agencies. There's much greater demand than there is supply, uh, and wages are pretty low and stagnant for these positions. I shared earlier that I previously worked as a direct support professional, um, and that was about 10 years ago. Um, some of the job postings that I've seen recently for that same position, the pay is really pretty close to what I was making 10 years ago. So we're not really seeing um, these jobs staying, staying with the rate of inflation. Um, so because, this, because of this turnover, we're seeing less oversight and more instability of care. Related to this, um, staff that do come into these positions um, might have a lack of experience, either a lack of experience in the field or just they don't have a lot of experience or support in recognizing or preventing the victimization of the people using their services. Uh, and another component of that is a lack of confidence. So if these folks are able to recognize um, in, uh, victimization or sexual abuse happening to the folks they're working with, uh, they may lack confidence uh, to move forward with the reporting. Um, they may lack confidence to give healthy relationship and sexual well-being coaching to people who use their services. That may be really uncomfortable for them because that's not something that they have experience in. Uh, they may not have the language um, or training available for that. Um, so adding to all of this, again, we're seeing how all of this kind of layers on top of each other. Um, 
there might be a lack of procedural clarity. So sometimes staff might be confused by the processes they're supposed to follow in a crisis intervention, um, especially if they are relatively inexperienced staff or if they're new to the organization, they may not be super familiar with the processes here. Um, so it's imperative that organizations implement abuse reporting procedures and regularly review those to ensure that staff understand them. Um, and so, again, going back to that staffing shortage, um, insufficient background checks are, we're seeing kind of at all levels. So um, background checks have to be conducted for folks at every level of disability organizations, including janitorial staff, maintenance staff, um, volunteers, and clerical or, or administration. Um, we also want to make sure that people that are going into caregiving positions um, have had a very thorough background check as well. I'm sure we've all seen some of the news reports of horrific abuse in group homes or nursing homes where we wonder how could this person have possibly been given this job? And it might be because they were just so short staffed um, that maybe they hired somebody before the direct uh, before the background check came back fully. Um, so that's just something that we really need to be aware of um, and figure out a way to be more supportive there. Um, and then Jennifer also talked about overly restrictive environments. So folks with disabilities experience life often within an authoritarian, authoritarian environment. So in settings like group homes, um, there may be a really tight schedule to ensure that everyone receives care with their activities of daily living. So that's stuff like showering, getting dressed, medication, eating. Um, and if there aren't enough staff um, in, the, in the home that day, um, outings may be canceled. So things that folks were really looking forward to, things that give them access to social inclusion may have to be sacrificed because there just simply aren't enough people. So then people with disabilities may not have a lot of agency or choice in the decisions or in how their day uh, goes, goes along. Um, okay, so I think we're ready to talk about the service gap analysis. Service gaps for people with intellectual disabilities or developmental disabilities. Um, this is also in the handout section as well, and you can find it on our Patreon resource hub. So with these risk factors in mind, um, the task force conducted informal assessments with disability service providers and three state divisions here in Indiana. Um, so we talked to the Bureau of Developmental Disability Services, uh, the Division of Aging, and the Department of Child Services. Um, so this was work that myself and another member of the task force did, uh, and she's actually from one of these state organizations, so she was very familiar with the processes, uh, and these conversations we had really opened both of our eyes to how the other half works, right? So we found three common gaps, um, or three common themes that lead to gaps in holistic care, uh, and you can see those on your screen now, so education, mandated processes, and advocacy. The table is divided into three columns. Underneath the purple education column, provider, staff, or family is not educated in sexual assault care, including advocacy. Provider staff are not educated on process after reporting the incident. Individual with ID or DD may not want to or know how to communicate details of the incident. Underneath the yellow mandated process column, Legal process or terminology is confusing for a person with ID or DD. Legal requirement for reporting abuse or victim might not want to report. Legal process is not trauma-informed. Underneath the orange advocacy column, no crisis or ongoing advocacy for person harmed. Trained sexual assault advocates are not educated on ID or DD issues. How do we make advocacy an automatic action step post-incident? All three columns point to two blue signs. Legal justice is not equal to restorative justice, and ID or DD world is disconnected from sexual assault crisis and prevention world. Um, we can move on to the next slide, please. So education, um, we've got multiple things going on here. We need education for disability service providers. We need education for victim service providers. And the community needs to be educated to ensure that survivors with disabilities are connected to the healing services they need following an incident of violence. Um, folks with disabilities also need access to information about their bodies, um, about desire, what's normal, what's healthy, what's natural, um, and about healthy relationships. 
Um, we need education on bodily autonomy, sexual literacy, and what's considered an appropriate touch um, so that folks can communicate their desires and report positive or harmful experiences. On the right is a picture of several people sitting and reading books. They are mostly light-skinned with long hair. They seem adolescent except an older person in the center who seems to be the instructor. The person on the far right is in a wheelchair with an earth graphic covering the wheel spokes. Okay, so mandated processes was the next theme. On the right is a stock image of several thick leather-bound books titled Law Cases. Uh, so these mandated processes ensure reports are made to the appropriate authorities to ensure the safety of the survivor as well as other consumers. Um, so these are really well-intentioned, but sometimes they can feel really sterile and confusing. Uh, and sometimes they're made against the will of the victim or the person harmed. Um, so because they're state mandated, disability service providers are moving forward with these processes without first getting the consent of the survivor involved. So in the anti-violence field, we talk a lot about empowering survivors and giving them space to make their own choices about reporting. And we also talk a lot about not mimicking the tactics of abusers. Um, so it's really challenging when an agency is state mandated to report um, regardless of what the survivor wishes. This is just something that um, needs to be communicated very clearly and very well to the survivor in question. Um, and so advocacy was the third major theme that we saw. On the right is a close-up of the word advocate in a thesaurus. It is surrounded by other words including champion, supporter, promoter. Advocates remind survivors of their rights, they empower survivors to choose what is right for them, and they provide emotional support to survivors during challenging situations. Uh, we found that advocacy is not built into this process currently for survivors with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, in order for survivors with disabilities to benefit from this advocacy, uh, disability organizations have to be informed um, about what's available to folks that they're working with. Um, so, and victim service providers also need to be educated on the unique needs of survivors with disabilities. Um, so you might be noticing a common theme in what I'm saying here, uh, but we're noticing that a lack of multi multidisciplinary communication, especially between disability serving organizations and uh, the anti-violence movement can really amplify these risk factors for sexual violence. Continuing to silo our work ensures that we aren't bridging these gaps and we're not attaining healing services for a community that is experiencing astronomical rates of sexual violence. Um, according to the University of Michigan, it's estimated that as many as 40% of women with disabilities experience sexual assault. Uh, and as many as, or I'm sorry, more than 90% of people with developmental disabilities will experience sexual assault in their lifetime. The Justice Department data also tells us that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are seven times more likely to experience sexual violence than people without an intellectual or developmental disability. So this is clearly a huge problem uh, that we have to work on. We have to increase communication between all providers involved. And that means we also need to create strong partnerships. Bridging the gap. On the right is a picture of a walking trail through a wooded park. A large gray dog walks across a wooden bridge over a small creek. Uh, we need to share our knowledge and educate both ourselves and our partners. Um, so there are some great opportunities here. Invite somebody who has expertise that you don't have into your agency to share their knowledge with you. And then you can kind of trade out. Then you'll go to their agency and share some information. Uh, I also want to highlight that when we're talking about education and training, I want to emphasize the difference between humility and competence. So probably a lot of folks have heard about cultural competency versus cultural humility. Um, so in that same vein, um, a person without a disability can't be competent in someone else's experience, right? Um, the disability community is not a monolith. There are infinite experiences of disability. Um, so just coming to a situation with a lot of humility, treating each person as an individual with individual needs, asking how you can support that person, um, making accommodations and not making a big deal of the fact that you're making accommodations, um, just showing that humility and respect for another person's humanity. Um, and I'd also like to say both disability service providers and victim service providers are doing that work. You're maybe just not thinking about it in that way. So in the disability serving world, folks talk about things like person-centered planning um, and person-first language. 
and in the victim services world, we talk about being survivor centered. So we're just marrying those two concepts. Also, there is not a one size fits all journey to healing. Uh, so we also want to make sure that we're noting that um, people with disabilities are not intrinsically more vulnerable than other people. Um, blaming disability for sexual violence is like blaming it on any other kind of identity, like race or gender. Um, an identity is not the reason that person is at risk of sexual violence. A person is at risk of sexual violence because of oppressive societal attitudes and inequitable structures that have disempowered that identity. Haley, can I give you a question from the question box about what you're talking about right now? Yeah. It's, um, the question says, if money were not a barrier, do you think it would be most effective and best overall if there were specific disability community focused sexual assault advocates and or disability focused sexual assault organizations or just really thorough cross training and knowledge and collaborative work? I think that's a really good question, and I don't know that I have an answer to that. Um, I know that there are some states that are doing that work. Um, I know I've spoken. I've spoken. Yeah, I spoke with a, an advocate in Arizona a few months ago um, who is, she works with the ARC of Arizona, um, but she's specifically a sexual assault victim advocate for people with disabilities. It sounds like it's a really great program, um, but she's also still working with um, rape crisis centers as well. So she'll go in and kind of be a bridge between a survivor with a disability and the rape crisis center. Um, so. I don't know if anybody else has experiences with that and would like to share. Me, Please pick me. Know. Yes, yes, Sierra. <laughs> um, I think that uh, there are multiple answers to this, um, and it goes back to what Haley said about the fact that there's no one size fits all. I think that it would probably be better if we were to cross collaborate, like Aaron, who asked the question, said. Um, and I mean, that was one of the options, but what I was gonna say was, there are so many barriers right now to this cross collaboration and so many misunderstandings. For example, people in disability services might think that HIPAA will prevent them from reaching out to their local rape crisis center, but HIPAA is to, to help that happen, not to prevent that from happening. So I think that it would be a better use of resources and strengths to cross collaborate. So because we are so underfunded and underpaid both in the anti-violence movement and in the disability serving agency movement, that cross collaboration might be more efficient and effective. Um, but I was, I popped on here because I just wanted to point everybody to um, Meg Stone's work. Meg Stone is a person who started out working in disability, I might be saying this wrong, but Meg Stone created their own, um, in Massachusetts, it's called Impact Ability. And um, originally her work started within, she was somebody coming from a rape crisis background and started working and being within the uh, disability serving organization. And that eventually grew into its own thing called Impact Ability. And their work is amazing. So check them out, they're in Boston. I, I'm, I actually just, is it okay if I also respond to this briefly? Yeah, please. The, the question about um, should we have designated specialists versus everyone just kind of knowing how to do this work? Um, I would strongly advocate in terms of being like um, philosophically congruent with disability justice philosophy. I think it's really important for us to try to get to a point where everybody is able to work with anybody who walks into your doors. Um, I don't think that it is ideal to have people who specialize in working with certain communities because I think that that very easily silos um communities and it also means that you know what if that person who is specialized is sick that day or can't come in and work with somebody who needs to speak to an advocate so i realize that like um many people have said on this that there's many reasons why people may do things differently but i think it's kind of a goal for everyone to be able to work with anybody who comes in needing services and the last thing um somebody requested if you could if Haley could please repeat the comment you made about um, people with disabilities not being labeled as vulnerable, but the importance of recognizing systemic oppression in this work, if you could please repeat that. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Sky and Sierra, also for jumping on to help me with this question. I definitely agree to what you were saying just there, Sky, that um, I think also that when we make special services for people, folks tend to feel further marginalized or further pushed away to the side instead of included. Um, so what I was saying about um, folks with disabilities are not intrinsically more vulnerable. Um, all humans are vulnerable, right? Like we all have vulnerabilities. Um, rather than saying that certain populations are vulnerable, we're noting that there are systemic and structural barriers and risk factors that are increasing exposure to sexual violence for certain groups. Um, so if we are tackling those bigger risk factors, um, it's not the disability that's really the problem here, right? It's um, the ableism, it's the lack of access to transportation, it's a lack of access to services uh, that increases the person's risk. Does that, was that clear? Would it be okay if I gave a very short example of this? Yes, please. That'd be great. Okay, y'all. So literally last month, I was in a bad car wreck and I miraculously got out of the car with bruises. I don't know how it wasn't way worse, but whenever I went into shock and I was really overstimulated, I stopped trying to pass as a non-autistic person. And I had a hard time speaking because I was in shock and autistic. And I was stimming, which means whenever you do self-stimulating things to calm yourself down, in that particular moment, I was doing like jazz hands. <laughs> I don't know, whatever, it made me feel better. Um, and whenever all the first responders arrived, they were like thinking that I, the wreck like broke me as a person. Like they were like, do you have a concussion? And I was too discombobulated to just be like, I'm autistic, I'm fine, leave me alone. <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't be left alone. But, <laughs> you know, like if, if they had just like worked with other autistic people, they probably would be like, oh, this person does not make eye contact and isn't speaking and they are stimming. And, you know, nothing was wrong with my hands. So anyway, there's just a really good example like that happened recently where like, if just generally people were used to working with people with disabilities, it wouldn't have been bizarre to them to see me existing how I needed. Yeah, that's an excellent example. Thank you for sharing that, Sky. Uh, so we will move on. Um, we've got a poll yeah. question up here on the screen now. A picture of a white arrow traffic sign labeled pole pointing to the left. Okay, so I something strange happens when the poll gets going and then I can't read it. This next poll question is going to ask you if you do sexual violence primary prevention programming with people with disabilities. And so the poll is now live. So if you're half paying attention, you come back to us and uh, select the best answer for you. And so if you're doing sexual violence primary prevention programming, that should say, does it include folks with disabilities? Apparently there, <laughs> there is a character limit and I'm so sorry for what you're seeing right now because it just stops at folks with. We're talking about folks with disabilities and your answers are yes, I do, no, I don't, no, but I want to, no, but I want to, so please contact me. And right now we have about 45% participation. So I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll and share the results with you. So you can go ahead and see that. So it looks like I'm, I'm so surprised and wonderfully surprised that 64% of our attendees say they are doing sexual violence primary prevention that includes people with disabilities. 8% of our attendees are no, 17% of our attendees want to, and 10% of people said, contact me. So we totally will. And you know, any of you are welcome to contact any of us at any time. So I'm gonna go ahead and hide that poll and go ahead and get out of the way for um, Haley. Thanks, Sierra. Um, wow, yeah, I'm really glad to see how many folks are engaging people with disabilities and their prevention programming. That's a really wonderful surprise for us. Um, I also just want to kind of plant the seed in your brain, too, um, that when you're thinking about that, um, not just 
are folks with disabilities welcome to join your prevention programming, but have you created prevention programming that you've also included, you thought about the needs of people with disabilities as you were doing that? So um, what does all of this mean for a crisis center? Is what can, what can we do in sexual assault programs? But also, I mean, many of you here are not necessarily um, in the sexual assault world. So what can you do uh, to, impl to implement these sexual violence primary prevention initiatives? So first and foremost, I wanna say that effective prevention programs are inclusive and are accessible to as many people as possible. It sounds like a lot of you know that and agree with that already. Um, so that's gonna include things like universal design. Um, are you thinking about font size um, when you're putting together printed materials? Um, do you offer things in large print? Um, are they offered in Braille? Um, are you use, utilizing basic fonts such as Arial or Tahoma um, and high contrast in your printed materials? On the right is a sign written in simple bold font, how to stay healthy from COVID-19. There's a grid of nine bits of advice with a small illustrative icon accompanying them. Wash your hands for 20 seconds. Cover your mouth with a tissue or sleeve when coughing or sneezing. Avoid touching your face. Use tissues and throw them away. Clean items around you like doorknobs, tables, and phones. If you have plans to travel, think about taking your trip after this crisis is over. Stay home if you're feeling sick. Stay home if you have family members who are sick. Call before visiting your doctor. Presented by SCDD. Um, web information should be utilizing the same kind of stuff. Um, very basic, easy to read fonts like Arial and Tahoma, high contrast, um, have descriptions of each image posted, and utilize language that is simple and concrete. And by that, we mean at a fourth to sixth grade reading level. Um, if you're making park marketing materials, um, all of that should be the same. Um, and you can actually utilize spell check in Microsoft Word to check the grade level of the language that you've been using. So if you go to spell check, look under grade level, uh, and you'll know if you're meeting that need. Uh, we also wanna make sure we're not using jargon or acronyms without already um, explicitly defining them. So we're not just gonna throw in the CDC without saying that that is the Centers for Disease Control. And I also want to note that um, the Indiana Governor's Council for People with Disabilities uh, will have a link to their website. Um, they have a, a great uh, example of uh, universal design and that simple and concrete language. Um, so we also want to think about outreach for your primary prevention. Um, who can you be reaching out to? Who can you be partnering with? Schools, yes, you're probably already doing some of that. Um, sexual assault programs, we're hearing that some of you are already partnering with disability service providers and vice versa. Um, are there case management organizations, um, centers for independent living that you can reach out to? Here in Indiana, we have also the Indiana Deaf Association, uh, the ARC of Indiana or local chapters of the ARC, uh, local self-advocates chapters, uh, various groups like that that you can be doing outreach with. Okay, if we want to move on. Um, so that's the basic stuff that we're probably already thinking about, but we can also elevate this work, right? On the right is a picture from the movie Up. Hundreds of colorful balloons carry a house above the clouds in a blue sky. Um, so how can we address the community and societal risk factors that we talked about earlier through this prevention work, through a sexual assault program? Um, so we're talking about not just the partnerships we were just talking about with disability service providers and all the regular stuff that we would think about, but also maybe public transportation agencies or housing authorities. We talked about how um, safe and affordable housing might be a barrier or a risk factor for some people. Um, transportation may be a risk factor and a barrier for some people. So how can we engage all of these groups to address the issues and make our communities safer, more inclusive, and more accessible? Um, so other things to think about are um, more than just making your current programs inclusive, what about doing some social inclusion as well? So um, doing community nights such as movie screenings, arts and crafts, um, cupcake decorating, bowling, stuff like that. It doesn't necessarily have to always be serious and focused on sexual violence, but you can just partner with an agency like Special Olympics or Best Buddies or Self Advocates to get together and just host a community night. 
Um, make sure those activities have accommodations and that the building you're hosting at is accessible. Um, but doing that just kind of gets your agency's name out there so that if there is an issue, if somebody uh, that any of these service providers are working with experience sexual violence, they know that you are a partner they can trust, that you are open and willing and able to serve folks with disabilities. Um, and so just kind of doing some targeted marketing also in spaces that folks with disabilities will be in, such as clubhouses, doctor's offices, community mental health centers, day programs, that kind of thing. Um, and reaching out to those previously mentioned community partners, just making a special effort to invite folks to come to the table. Haley? Yes. Can I add something really quick? Or actually, Please. I know Sky wants to um, add something, but Carly, who is with the Arc of Indiana, wanted us to also mention local systems of care and children's mental health initiative wraparound yes. facilitators, which I have to say, as a person who is currently in a CMHI getting support, it has changed our lives dramatically. Okay, I'm gonna be quiet now. No, I love that. We talked about this yesterday. Um, all three of you that are co-hosting with me, feel free to jump in whenever you have something to say. So, hi, Sky. Um, hey, is it okay if I respond to another question quickly or would you like me to do that yes. later? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, Claire says, I work on a college campus. When it comes to prevention programs, students with learning disabilities who are blind or deaf are generally not taken into consideration when designing these programs especially since there is a mass educational effort at the beginning of the fall semester. In addition, college students must self-identify in order to receive services. Women in particular often don't self-identify. What suggestions do you have for prevention professionals who are attempting to do outreach? So I wanted to mention a couple of um, things. So one is that uh, this is an amazing question because I think what it gets to is the fact that you can't assume who does or doesn't have disabilities. And in order to make sure that you're deliberately doing outreach and working with people of every kind of disability or ability level, you actually want those people involved. So I, Mesa, the, where I work, is based out of Purdue University, which is a pretty large uh, R1 campus. And we have a disability resource center. And so very frequently, um, our program is in conversation with the Disability Resource Office, and a lot of our collaborators are also involved with the Disability Office. So making sure that if you're a prevention programmer or someone who is working on violence prevention, you know, making contact with the Disability Resource Office can be really helpful because it can also connect you to students who, or staff who are living with those disabilities who can also help guide your prevention efforts and your outreach efforts. Thank you, Sky. That's, I love that question, and thank you for lifting that up. Um, I know in conversation, as we were preparing for this, we were also talking about kids um, in K through 12 who have maybe I, IEPs or 504 plans um, are often kind of left out of these conversations. So um, working together with uh, all the groups that Sierra and Sky just mentioned to make sure everyone is at the table and everyone has access to this information. Uh, so the last kind of couple of things I wanted to mention for sexual assault programs or for rape crisis centers, um, are people with disabilities represented among your staff? Um, I know we talk a lot in the sexual violence field about um, if I walk in the doors of your rape crisis center, will I see people that look like me? Because that will make me feel more comfortable. That will make me feel like I am understood, seen, and heard. And it's going to make me more able to open up. Uh, because I don't fear of people judging me. I don't think people are going to have a completely different framework and context. Um, so consider that. Um, if you don't have folks with disabilities on your staff, maybe hiring a consultant with a disability. Um, Sierra, would you share a little bit about uh, the task force um, and the consultant program that you have going on, how you guys have hired Jennifer? Absolutely. I would be happy to share that. So part of the, the work that we wanted to do, and this relates to what Sky said earlier about the process is the outcome, is we knew that we were going to be asking a lot of working professionals to 
help us do our work, but we also knew that we wanted to work with others who may have barriers to employment. So part of our funding request was for um, stipend money so that anybody who is not already paid by their job to be part of the Indiana Abuse Prevention Disability Task Force actually gets paid for every single time they go and do a thing related to the task force. And so we have meeting stipends, but um, meeting stipends are a different pay rate than hourly consulting. So we just set a random amount of $30 per meeting. And um, we actually use the $30 amount and that stays the same on our budget, but we pay $30 an hour for consulting. So that's for the other work that people like aside from working um, in, in a meeting. So of the task force work that we did was in subcommittee meetings and random little pop-up meetings and if we had the rule that you could only get paid for the main task force meeting it would also be a very inequitable exchange and we would get tons of labor for no like we wouldn't be giving anything back other than our amazing work together so um that is because so we were successful in doing that and so not only are we able to pay community members to join us for meetings but also pay them an hourly consulting fee for that work um we also pay for mileage and transportation and we we arrange for that so that the coalition pays the expense. A lot of grants, including the RPE, are on um, reimbursement. And so um, we try not to make our efforts reimbursement, although um, unfortunately that is kind of how it works. You do your timesheet and you get paid on your timesheet. Um, am I forgetting? Oh, we pay for data collection. That's something weird and new that I don't think um, you know a lot of projects have the capability of doing that but it, we learned that um you know if we want to collect data from people who are not being included in data collection we should also pay for their time as well and so we do that did i forget anything sky or haley or jen <laughs> thank you sarah um so all of that to say that this is a spectrum. So if you don't have capacity to do everything that we've listed today, that's okay. Um, but how? just think of ways that you can make your center more welcoming to people with disabilities. Think of ways that you can use some of what we, talk, what we have talked about today uh, to implement these primary prevention initiatives. Um, this is a spectrum, but it's also a journey. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I am an aspiring ally in the disability justice community. I am not fully arrived, and I don't think I will ever be fully arrived. Um, we're all still learning this together, but the important thing is that we're learning, we're learning in community, um, and we're trying to, yeah, learn and grow together every day. Uh, so I think that's it for our content. We're going to move into our next poll. Um, so if you are a sexual violence program or a rape crisis center program, uh, what types of disability agencies are you partnering with? And vice versa, if you're a disability serving agency, um, what kind of sexual assault programs are you working with in your work? Uh, and if there's somebody we haven't thought of, please speak up and let us know what you're doing too. We'd love to hear what everyone's doing. And then Sierra, I'm gonna pass back to you so that you can read uh, folks' responses. Okay. We have the ARC and ACI, and I'm going to ask Jennifer to spell out what ACI is. The ARC is um, an organi a disability, a state or a national disability serving agency. We have transition programs for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities, group homes, and day habilitation programs. We have um, an Alliance Center for Independence, partnering with Special Olympics in King, oh, with King County Arc, that's so cool. Disability Rights Washington, oh, King County in, in Seattle. Oh, that's where I was born. Anyway, um, um, Disability Access Center, um, the Arc Minnesota, rock on. 
Families First brings in accessibility for staff trainings. Accessibility is one of the backbones and co-facilitators of the Abuse Prevention Task Force. Very, very cool. Uh, our council disability, um, sorry, it just popped up and I lost my spot. Um, the, our Council for Developmental Disabilities, EARC, Evansville Association for the Blind, Sycamore Services, PNA, ooh, I don't know what that means, maybe I should, Disability Rights Wisconsin, wow, they have a VOCA grant. Oh, congratulations, that's, they're doing um, SA and DV. Area, two Area 10 agencies, FSSA, um, Family and Social, Social Services Administration, Bureau of Demental, Developmental Disability, uh, Developmental Disability and Rehabilitative Services, and PNA means Protection and Advocacy Agency. Thank you. A lot. I'm so impressed with this list. Should I keep reading? What are our thoughts? A sign sketched on blue ruled notepaper says Q&A. You have questions, we may have answers. Does anybody have any questions for the panelists, for the task force? Oh, I'll be quiet. <laughs> we, we need to figure out how we're gonna like notify each other whenever we're like coming on. Okay, uh, Okay. sorry. Uh, since we have a few minutes for questions, um, there was somebody who just submitted a question and I wanted to be able to respond to them. So let me scroll up. A lot of you said responses. Um, okay, so the question says, this question might just be specific to my campus and I can certainly follow up individually later if that saves time. What insight would your team offer for those of us on a college campus who work with survivors and disability resource centers specifically around navigating accommodations for the classroom and housing? Our campus often does not recognize accommodation requests for neurotypical able-bodied survivors unless the survivor is documented as having a disability, which many students are hesitant to pursue or even may feel a great sense of shame navigating through the disability resource. Um, I don't know why, but it's not allowing me to scroll down. Um, but okay, so basically the question is, how do we support survivors um, who may not identify as having disabilities with acquiring um, uh, accommodations in classrooms and housing? Um, I think one thing that could be helpful, which you may already be doing, is that Title IX already has avenues for providing, like federal legal guidance says that students who are survivors should be eligible for reasonable accommodations based on their survivorship because there is a federal recognition that experiences of violence interrupt people's access to education and that anything that interferes with a person's ability to access their education is in violation of Title IX in terms of violence, harassment, or discrimination. So what you, if you have like really resistant faculty, you can tell them that by not accommodating student survivors, they are potentially in violation of Title IX, which is a federal, um, a federal law, sorry, aphasia. Um, and so that, that also helps you so that um, maybe the student has PTSD, but they don't want that to be registered as having a disability because of their own feelings about that. Um, I think on one hand, you can maybe work on helping them understand that trauma and experiencing PTSD can be a disability and maybe help them in, in learning about that in a way that is destigmatized. But if the survivor, like maybe that's not um, helpful for your situation, at the very least, you can work with faculty and staff to make sure that they understand that completely regardless of disability status, Title IX says that students should have access to reasonable accommodations on the basis of their survivorship. Does anybody have um, questions or clarifications or want to add to what I just said? I do not have expertise to add to that, but it sounds like 
this is something that people would want to learn more about. And Sky and I are, um, we were working with someone who has a lot of expertise about campus accessibility. And I think it's worth trying to have that webinar this um, during this series. It'd be kind of well, great. Such a good idea. Like just have a webinar about Title IX and disability yeah. justice and violence prevention. We should totally do that. We're this is okay. why this is why we love having y'all's questions because we have evidence. I mean, like we have lots of witnesses. So <laughs> yeah, this is um, this is this is also why we really appreciate your questions because having an understanding of what people want to learn more about helps us understand like what else we should be doing to support y'all and all of your amazing work. Yes, I Absolutely. would just add for that question. Um, Title IX coordinator, yes, and if uh, you are not connected to a sexual assault advocate on your campus or your local rape crisis center, um, you could definitely reach out to them for assistance as well. Um, and then I don't know what state that person was from, if they're from here in Indiana, but you can also reach out to your state coalition to end sexual assault as well for guidance. Uh, we have a ton of resources here in Indiana about that also. Um, I may not have an immediate answer for you, but we will go through the documents and the resources and figure it out together. I have a question um, from a participant. It says, do you have any additional trainings on sexual violence and domestic violence disability programming? And um, Anna, I wonder if you could specify what you mean by programming. Um, but wait, there's more. We can share our, so um, the, the slide that you have in front of you is part of our resource sharing bonanza. And so these slides are available for you to download in your handouts. Um, 2018 webinar series on YouTube, 2019 webinar series on Patreon, 2019 to 2020 webinar series, The Hub on Patreon, Elevatus Training, Vera Institute of Justice Accessibility Materials and Disability Webinars. Contact the presenters. All links will be available in video notes. Area of the dashboard and all of these are URLs. So you can click on them and go to our, we've done 10 webinars in this series. This is the 11th. Um, we are sharing with you um, on our Patreon. Disability Justice and Sexual Violence Prevention Online Resource Hub. On the right is a blue circle divided into three sections, 10 plus webinars, data and resources, and conference reviews. In the center is a gray circle labeled The Hub. Join us free in our online resource community, patreon.com forward slash in disability justice. Please follow us on Patreon, disability related articles, blogs, sexual violence prevention resources, conference reviews, webinars, we have a lot of resources. We don't have a specific program per se. Um, Sky, do you do you have feedback about that question or Haley? Yeah, or so the person added more so how to work with individuals with disabilities specifically as a crisis center educator. Ah. So I will I say that um, one of our webinars is just entirely dedicated to best practices for working with people with disabilities for any kind of service provision agency that might be helpful to what you're asking about. And there, like um, Sierra said, there are webinars on a lot of different topics and I'm not remembering all of them right now. But if, if you find that that is not um, specifically what you're looking for, you're welcome to email us and we can uh, try to direct you to something that is more helpful. Yes, I think that's a really great idea. One of the things that we like to do is try to pay attention to all of the disability justice and sexual violence prevention things that are happening across the nation because it can be, it can feel like a lonely uh, pursuit. So we do produce a lot of tools that are available for you to use. And one way to easily get that is to follow us on our Patreon. You do not have to become a patron you can just simply click the follow button from our patreon and I'll um, in in the handout slides you can get access to that URL please follow us on patreon a screen grab shows the Indiana disability justice and violence prevention patreon with a banner showing sky 
Sierra and a couple of other people smiling shoulder to shoulder. Step 1. Click Follow. Step 2. Click Sign Up with Google or Facebook. It's free. Disability-related. Articles. Blogs. Sexual violence prevention resources. Conference reviews. Webinars. Narrator's note. The Patreon has been retired. Please visit us at indisabilityjustice.org. Link available in video notes. Um, or if you want to, it's patreon.com, I-N, Disability Justice. So then you would be updated on any kind of tools that are being published. So I just created a post last night about Elevate Us Training. Um, and I will give you their website. But I highly recommend that people go to, um, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, you can join us next Friday on a webinar about sexual wellness for people with disabilities. Um, as sexual violence primary prevention, we're going to have uh, people, members of the task force and uh, Dr. Ciccarelli, who is a um, medical doctor and a professor at IU. And um, if you are interested in checking out our other webinars that we've done over the last several years, look at our webinar channel. And we also have these things available where you don't have to register for them on the um, YouTube. I just said the YouTube. Okay, here's Elevate Us Training. I really, really recommend that you go to their website immediately after this and sign up for their newsletter. They, this is, this is just been such an enormous gift to people who are looking for um, information about healthy sexuality for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, but there's so much more on that website. Cropped screen grabs of the website show a smiling, light-skinned couple, a menu of online courses, and free downloadable resources including sex-positive quiz, sexually healthy person handout, GULP newsletter, talking with your kids about sexuality and more. www.elevatustraining.com That's www.elevatustraining.com And I feel very rushed because I don't want to keep you after 2.30. So I'm just going to mention that the Vera Institute of Justice has a tremendous amount of information and resource available. And actually, you can find programming about increasing your capacity of your rape crisis center there at, at those websites. Vera Institute of Justice Center on Victimization and Safety. Disability and Sexual Violence Prevention slash Intervention Resources. Disability Webinars. Evaluate Capacity to Prevent Sexual Violence for Rape Crisis Centers and Disability Services. Increase Research. Budgeting for Access. In-person events, online events, print and electronic resources. All links will be available in video notes. And if you're interested, this... Um, web page is updated all the time. Um, over the last three months, the content on this web page has tripled. So I highly recommend going to these websites and um, bookmarking them and coming back because uh, Vera is always updating and, and so is Elevate Us Training. And um, finally, this is how you reach any one of us. All of us are part of the task force and we're working really hard to keep bringing wonderful content and work to you. I'm just so happy that I get to work with these people. Folks, do you have any, um, anything else? Oh, I was gonna just say, so we're not holding people up. If they wanna send us questions, um, please feel free to email us um, and also, on this amazing federal holiday, dog holiday called social distancing. Um, I <laughs> wanted to let you all know, <laughs> my dogs think it's a very glorious holiday. Um, my, uh, I wanted to tell everybody as a quick PSA that NPR, um, the news organization, has created an amazing list of things that are not usually free, but which are now free. If you have too much time on your hands as you are social distancing, and if any of you are people with disabilities who are also gym rats, 
I would like to recommend that Peloton has actually offered to give us all their app for free for 90 days. And it's not just bicycling, like they actually do free yoga and workouts and whatever else. And I think it would be delightful if Peloton was inundated by people with disabilities who want to use it. So I love that. As we continue to press for greater social change, I think that would be awesome. So uh, I just wanted to give those two recommendations as we are all uh, giving you this webinar from our living rooms and bedrooms. Have a wonderful rest of your week, everyone. We hope really to quickly. see you next Friday. It looks like mine and Jennifer's email has been cut off from this slide. So to contact me, oh. Haley at icasahd.org. Uh, and Jennifer, would you want to share your email address as well? The screen switches to editing view with the slides in order on the left column. Is that any better? No. Um, uh, J J e Someone moves the text up screen so Jennifer's contact information is visible. And the last name at gmail.com. Yes, so okay. Jennifer's email is Jen, J-E-N, and then her last name, M-I-L-H-A-R-C-I-C, -I -I at gmail.com. Contact us. Haley Rigger, gender pronouns, she, her, hers, Rape Crisis Center Coordinator. Indiana Coalition to End Sexual Assault and Human Trafficking, Incorporated, 9245 North Meridian Street, Suite 227, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46260, 317-624-2370, Haley, H-A-L-E-I-G-H, at I-C-E-S-A-H-T dot org. Sierra Olivia Thomas Dash Williams, gender pronouns, she, her, hers. Prevention Specialist, Indiana Coalition Against Domestic Violence, 1915 West 18th Street, Suite B, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46202. C. Williams at ICADVINC dot org, 317-917-3685. Sky Ashton Cantilla Prevention Coordinator. Gender pronouns, please ask. Program Coordinator Multicultural Efforts to End Sexual Assault, MESA, Purdue University, 915 West State Street, LILY 4 401, West Lafayette, Indiana, 47907. Email K A N T O L A at P U R D U E dot E D U. 817 269 8729. Jennifer Malarsic, gender pronouns, she, her, hers. Disability consultant, I C A D V. J E N M I L H A R C I C at gmail dot com. And you can get that in your handouts. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Thanks, hey, everybody. I'm... Sierra and Jen <laughs> wave goodbye. I'm going to do an experiment um, where I end the webinar, but we stay. Sky and Jen zoom to full screen. Sky on the left and Jen on the right. They laugh. Sky screen jostles and Haley pops into the bottom left corner. They speak inaudibly. Haley seems confused and waves her pointed index finger. She nods okay. Sky holds her fist to her mouth. Sky talks and looks back and forth. Jen speaks. Sky leans in, intently scanning the screen.
Haley checks her phone, which has a dark blue case. She nods. Haley disappears and Sky checks their phone. They lean in and talk more, the computer screen reflecting in their glasses. Sky disappears and Jen's face fills the screen. In her pink hoodie with the top of her hair in a ponytail, she is squinting and mouthing. 